So um, what types of machine learning problems do we have? Uh, I've tried to put a few on the slides. So I've talked a bit about uh, market basket <coughs> analyzers. So analyzing that people who have kids buy diapers and milk and people who don't buy beer and hamburgers. Uh, and uh, so this is called association rule learning. So learning that a person who buy diapers is more likely to buy milk than a person who doesn't, uh, for instance. Um, and the general idea is that you want to discover relationships with diff between your different variables. In this case, your variables are the different items you can purchase at the supermarket. Uh, they are not bought independently from one another. Uh, can you <coughs> learn from what people are buying? What are the items that are bought together? What are together? What are the items that are not bought together? So two main classes of problems we're going to talk about during this course are supervised learning and unsupervised learning. So supervised learning is, predict some, is to predict some sort of outcome. So a label, cat, non-cat, or a number, a height, a time, uh, a weight, um, based on features or variables that describe the data. So for instance, if I take an image, uh, it has a certain number of pixels in it. Uh, you can say that each of those pixels is a variable. Can you, from those variables, label the pictures as cat or non-cat? <coughs> this is called classification. Regression is learning a number. So can you, from uh, genetic variables from a patient, learn where does this... Uh, <coughs> learn, or from a person, not necessarily a patient, can you figure out how tall that person is? And what does that tell you about the variables that you've used to figure out how tall the person is? Uh, ranking uh, is a problem of, uh, instead of figuring out actual values, so how tall the person is, uh, you just want to figure out who is taller than whom. So you can cast this problem as a regression <coughs> problem. Once you've found everybody's height, you can rank them. But you can also try to directly rank the people without looking at their height, without predicting their exact height. Um, and then you have predicting ordered categories. So for instance, uh, scores. So, that are, so when we're talking about height, we're talking about a, something that takes a continuous value, at least in some domain. Uh, when we're talking about scores, so for instance, ratings of a movie on Netflix, uh, you only have, I think, five possible variables, so from one star to five stars or something like that. Uh, so if you cast this as a regression problem <laughs> that is going to predict a continuous value, uh, you're going to predict 3.2 and 7.8 and those kind of things. Uh, of course, you can, again, again uh, bring those things back into one, two, three, four, five, and say anything above five is five, anything below one is one, <coughs> anything between one and 1 1.5 is also one, and those kind of things. But you might find it easier to solve the problem directly as predicting a, those categories. You have five categories, so ranking one, two, three, four, five, uh, and they're ordered. So Rankings of two and three are closer to each other than ranking of two and five, which makes it a bit different from a classification problem where you would have five classes of, say, animals. Unsupervised learning is a bit a similar idea, except that you don't have labels to your data. You just have a bunch of data, and you're trying to learn something about this data, but you don't have uh, information about so you have a bunch of pictures, but no one told you what pictures of what they are. Two things that you might be interested in doing. One is dimensional issue reduction, uh, which is, well, imagine you have your uh, pictures represented as, uh, I don't know, they are like 64 pixels over 64 pixels. That's a lot of pixels, a lot of variables. Are all those variables important uh, and why? So dimensional, dimensionality reduction aims <coughs> at finding the features that are important in the data or at finding new ways of representing the data with fewer variables uh, 
so that you can maybe visualize it or that it can make more sense. I will have some examples coming. The other things you can do in unsupervised learning is clustering, so grouping together uh, objects that look alike. Uh, so then maybe you haven't been able to assign a label to the cats and the dogs and the birds in your data set, but you've grouped together cats and dogs and birds, and you, don't need, you just need a human to come look at it for a quarter of a second and say, that's cats, that dogs, and birds. So there's two other classes of problems uh, that I wanted to briefly mention. Uh, Semi-supervised learning, which is uh, data in which, so you have data, some of the objects are labeled, are, la are labeled, sorry, some are not. So for instance, you have a bunch of pictures. Some of those pictures have been annotated as being of cats or dogs or birds, and the others have not. So how can you learn labeled uh, based on those data you have, also using the objects that were not labeled? And reinforcement learning, uh, which I don't talk about at all in this course, uh, is uh, more about maximizing uh, reward. So that's the first uh, thing someone said when I asked what is learning. Someone said, well, if you're, you try something out and if you make a mistake, uh, you learn from your mistakes. That's the idea that there. I've talked about market basket analysis already. Here's a more specific example of classification. So we've <coughs> talked about credit scoring. So you want to identify whether you should, loan money, you should lend money to someone or not. So imagine you have two variables. One is income and one, one is savings. So someone who has a high income is <coughs> saving a lot of money uh, is someone you want to lend money to because we only lend the rich. Uh, someone who has no income and is not saving any money is someone who is not going to be able to repay lo your loan. So uh, you also don't want to loan here. You don't want to loan to people who earn a lot of money but spend it all because they're not going to spare, save enough money to repay your loan. Uh, well, this quadrant here is maybe a bit more uh, tricky, but essentially... Uh, if people don't make much money and they want to borrow lots of money, even if they're good at saving, they just won't be able to save enough to repay a loan. Um, so you have here two classes. One is low risk and one is high risk, uh, depending on income and savings. And uh, you want to learn a function that separates those two classes. Those two classes. Um, so classification is also called discriminant analysis because this function you want to learn, which is separating those classes, uh, and here is defined as income being greater than a given threshold, savings being greater than another threshold, uh, is called a discriminant. Here's an example of things that is uh, done in image in vision. Uh, that's a bit more interesting than identifying whether something is a cat or a dog. Uh, which is face recognition. So you get mm -hmm. some pictures of someone and you have to figure out which of these images is a person above. So as a human being, uh, I hope you all have the solution. Uh, as a computer, <laughs> it's much harder to figure out. Okay, so regression, we said, uh, was about predicting a <coughs> real value. Uh, so in the sense, real number. Uh, so here's an example. Again, it's simplified, um, but you can see uh, the, uh, <coughs> try to predict the price of a used car based on mileage. So the more uh, the car has been used and the cheaper you can sell it or buy it. Um, so here we have a very simple uh, a model for this data, which is linear. We're just trying to learn uh, the coefficient a and b uh, such, that, such that price is a linear function of mileage. Um, so another way of writing that is that we want to find a function f uh, such that when it's applied to the variables x, given some coefficients or parameters theta, you get y out of it. So this is a very simple example in that we're doing linear regression with one variable. 
uh, you'll see that we actually do a lot of linear regression in machine learning, uh, but usually with more than one variable. Um, but you can also do all sorts of other, re other regressions, so you can try to fit more complicated functions and they're just linear, so that's some sort of polynomial function, uh, or some very weird functions that uh, have odd shapes. Um, so most of my examples come from bioinformatics because this is what I do, but uh, you can also uh, need regression to compute the angle at which a robot must move its arm uh, or how much the uh, steering wheel of your Google car shall turn when encountering a pedestrian in front of it. Uh, although in that situation, I guess braking would be a better idea. Um, in bioinformatics, uh, we want to predict age of onset of a disease. Uh, we want to predict uh, things as the solubility of a component uh, of a chemical compound in water. <coughs> Uh, because solubility is an important property of a drug. If it doesn't dissolve, then you swallow it, and then you eject it, and it never uh, reached any of the cells in your body, and uh, it didn't do anything. Uh, yield of a crop, if you're uh, doing uh, agronomics. Uh, so if you have a new genome for a plant, are you going to get more out of the same number of seeds? Um, <coughs> Ranking, I've talked about some applications of ranking uh, in so a branch of bioinformatics, which is called chemoinformatics, which is um, instead of studying genomes and uh, protein sequences and uh, those kind of things, you study small molecules. Why? Because small molecules are drugs. Uh, so one application is virtual screening uh, in which you you have one protein, which we call the target. Uh, that's a protein uh, which is involved in a particular biological process. And you know that if you disrupt the behavior of that protein, uh, you cure uh, the disease that someone is suffering from. Uh, so that's, for instance, that's how antibi antibiotics work. Uh, they target one specific protein, uh, which is involved in building the membranes of bacteria. And if you disrupt the behavior of that protein, uh, the bacteria can't build a membrane anymore, and then they can't survive. And that's how penicillin, for instance, works. Um, so often in drug design, the question you have is that you know the protein you want to disrupt. You don't know which uh, compound is going to disrupt it. So if you're a big pharmaceutical company, you can do very expensive tests where you test a million of molecules and it's called them uh, against your protein. Uh, if you're not a very big pharmaceutical company, you try to predict using computer models uh, what kind of compounds are the most likely to be working so as to reduce the cost of your final experiment. So that's what's called virtual screening. Um, so ranking is also involved in recommender systems. So recommender systems is the name we give to all these uh, Netflix and Amazon and all those websites that make recommendations to you based on previous ratings or previous purchases you've made. Uh, so here again, the idea is that they want to rank their catalog and offer to you only the top ranked suggestions. <coughs> Um, and in information retrieval, which is uh, essentially web search, uh, you in a way want to rank, uh, it's not how it works exactly, you don't try to rank the entire internet because that's way too many pages, but uh, that's sort of what happens. Uh, you want to rank web pages uh, on the web or maybe documents in a collection according to the keywords of a request. What are, what are the top matches? So that's again ranking. Okay, so I've talked about machine learning as something we do to make predictions about uh, new or unseen objects. But there's a few other applications. Um, I've mentioned this when I've talked about bioinformatics. <coughs> 
we're often also interested in knowledge extraction. So not only we're interested in making predictions, but we want to be able to interpret the rules that we've made to make a new prediction. So for instance, when I was giving the example of uh, predicting the age of onset of a disease, actually you don't really do that because you want to be able to tell a patient uh, you'll probably be sick by the time you're 52. You want to do that because you want to understand what are the genes or the mutations uh, that are involved in the fact that the patient is likely to get sick at 52. Or the same thing if you try to find which, if you try to predict uh, whether uh, patients uh, have cancer or not, the goal is to find which are the variables you use uh, to predict cancer or non-cancer. So for instance, you try to use all the genes uh, and then you find that some models with only a few genes in it uh, in them work better. So probably those key genes are the genes that are involved in the disease you're interested in, in a simplified way again. Um, then you have compression. So what we're saying here is that uh, we take an object and from this object we're able to make um, a prediction about what its label should be. So in particular, if you've done that using dimensionality reduction at some point, uh, from this object, you've extracted a representation from which you can build a label. So maybe instead of storing the whole object, you only need to store this compressed representation. Um, <coughs> and uh, outlier detection is a bit different from classification. Uh, the idea is that so you have unlabeled data, and the question is, can you identify in this data the objects that don't behave like the others? Um, so one way to do this is to, uh, so we'll talk about clustering, is to group, try to group your data, uh, your objects together. You'll find some groups of things that behave the same, and then you'll find like a few points that don't go into any of the groups. So those are called outliers. They don't follow the same rules as the others. But if you're doing classification problem and you find them in your data, in your training data, in the data that was given to you, uh, some of the objects don't <coughs> obey the rules that you found that works for most of the other objects, uh, then there might be something interesting and weird about these objects. I mean, it might be interesting and if you're working on uh, data that comes from uh, scientific experiments, most likely your experiments failed, something failed to be measured, and that's why you have an outlier. But sometimes it's an interesting case. So I was just talking about clustering, which is grouping objects into uh, groups that have similar behaviors. Um, so of course the key point here is to define what similar means, and we'll talk about that. Uh, the goal is to understand some general characteristics of your data. So if you have three groups in your data of customers, uh, what are the differences between those groups? And can you maybe develop a different marketing strategies for, strategy for those three groups? Those kind of things. It can also be interesting for visualization. Uh, so maybe if you want to get a closer look at your data, you don't need to look at all the <coughs> objects that behave the same. So you have three groups, maybe you only look at one representer object for each of those three groups, and it's much easier to see what happens when you only have to look at three objects versus 3,000. Um, and of course, uh, based on how you grouped those objects together, you can infer some interesting properties of why were those objects grouped together? What does this mean about my data? Um, so I've given this, the example of uh, grouping customers together. This can be used for image <coughs> compression. So for smart image compression, you group together all the pixels that have the same color, similar colors, uh, and then you assign a single color to them. And you don't have to predefine beforehand uh, the rules for grouping uh, colors together. So if you have... Uh, an image that has mostly gray and blue, you will learn to represent it with only two colors. 
But if then you bring in an image that's mostly red and green, uh, you will be able to use the same method to also represent all the shades of red by the same red and all the shades of green by the same green without having before uh, said uh, that all pixels that have this color value should be represented by a single color value. Um, this can be used to cluster documents. Uh, so if you have a large corpus of, say, uh, press <laughs> articles, so you have like uh, everything that's been published uh, in the newspapers in the last week, and you can try to group them together and then figure out what they're talking about. So there'll be things about Volkswagen, things about Greece, things about Syrian refugees. Uh, I'm going to stop here because it's going to get depressing. Um, so that's, uh, I mean, here I can tell you already what's <laughs> in the press, so it might not have been a very interesting example. But this is how people, this is how you do automatic learning of uh, what a new document is about. So without having a human being reading it, you give, once you've learned this, uh, you give a new uh, press article and the algorithm can autom automatically detect what's uh, its topic. And that's how Google News work. Uh, so you know, you go to Google News and then it has like some highlighted stories and if you click on one story, it suggests see 1,234 stories about the same topic. So that's how it does it. And in bioinformatics, we use clustering to learn motifs, uh, so things that are repeated in the data. So for instance, in protein sequences, you'll find that some um, series of DNA, uh, well, letters of the DNA, so, you know, ATGC, you find that some of those are repeated throughout the DNA or only in certain places, and that's probably not just by chance. Uh, then you can look at them more closely and try to figure out what is their role. Okay, and <coughs> dimensionality reduction. So I've seen before is you have a large number of variables to describe your data. You're trying to find fewer variables uh, to describe the same data. So there's essentially two families, two, yeah, two families of approaches. Uh, one is feature selection, which is you try to f just keep some of, the feature, some of the variables that you already had. Um, so that's what I was talking about when I was saying you're trying to predict uh, whether someone is, has a particular disease or not based on a list of their genes. So the variables are all the genes in the genome. And then you try to figure out which of those genes are the ones that are important and which are the ones you don't need to look at. So that's feature selection. You select among the features you already have, which, are, which ones are the interesting ones. <coughs> Feature extractions is building new uh, variables based on the one you have uh, that represent your data. Um, so usually by doing projections on some uh, well-chosen spaces. So we'll see that towards the end of this course. Um, the goal is uh, multifold. Uh, as I've said, there is interpretability. If, you had, if you're able to explain things based on three genes rather than the entire genome, uh, you can start looking at what is the role of those three genes. Uh, and visualizations goes with that. It's easier to make plots in 2D or 3D. Uh, I only have plots in 2D uh, than in 1000D. Um, and also reducing both storage and computational time. So if instead of 3,000 dimensions, I only need three, I need less space, and I probably need less computational efforts to process those three dimensions. So the last example, well, the last category of approaches was reinforcement learning. Uh, so I mentioned this is, you can see that as learning from your mistake. So in reinforcement, reinforcement learning, uh, that's what people use mostly in robotics. Uh, so Say you want to teach a robot to play ping pong. You don't have, so you can have data, which is examples of people playing ping pong, or maybe you go behind your robot and you play along with the robot. Um, but then you don't assign a label to this data. Well, I guess you could assign a label that says that was a good move, good move that was not a good move. But 
it's kind of hard to say about playing ping pong which move exactly was a good move and which one was not because you only see that at the end of a succession of moves uh, did you manage to score or did you lose the ball. That's why we're talking about delayed reward. So you don't know the instant you're making an action. I mean, an action for a robot is a succession of decisions of position <laughs> of its arm. So you don't know for this position whether it's right or not um, until you've finished the movement and seen what was happening. So you have all this series of movements. And what you're learning is not so much uh, a label to assign to movement, <coughs> good or not, but a policy. What is a policy? It's something that helps you decide what is the right course of action. You learn a sequence of actions that you should take to achieve your goal, which is to score with your ping pong ball.